come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be sharing a bit of a how to play as well as reviewing Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion from Avalon Hill Games. So is this a game that belongs in the collection of every Scooby-Doo aficionado? Or will the only mystery be, why did you buy this in the first place? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned, I am going to be reviewing Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion in just a moment. But first, let me remind you, if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ring that bell. It'll notify you not only when I upload videos such as this, it'll also tell you when my live stream, The Daily Dope, airs right here on YouTube, Monday through Thursday nights, with the latest in tabletop gaming news. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. All right, as I mentioned, we are going to be learning a little bit of how to play as well as uh, having me share my review of Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. It is from Avalon Hill. It's designed by Banana Chan, Noah Cohen, Rob Davio, and Brian Neff. The game is for three to five players, ages eight and up. Plays in around 25 to 50 minutes. It is going to carry an MSRP of $35 when it arrives on July 24th. Let's swing on over to the other camera and jump on in. I have laid out the components of Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. And I will mention that I already shot an unboxing video. So if you want to get a much closer look at these components, by all means, I will toss a card up there. You can click on that. You might want to check that out first and then come back to the review because I'm not going to focus too much on the components outside of telling you what they do. So the premise of this game, if you are not familiar with betrayal games, the players are going to be investigating a mystery. So with uh, Scooby-Doo here, we're going to actually have inside and outside tiles that we will select. We're looking to obtain clues. We can have, we can find items, events can take place and at a certain point, we are going to trigger what is known as the haunt, where one of the players is suddenly going to switch sides and they are going to take on the role of the baddie. Now, normally what will happen is the person who triggers the haunt is the one who is replaced, basically. They take over the role of the, the villain in the story, but... In this case, you also have the option of you can decide ahead of time. So because this game is for ages eight and up, it is Scooby-Doo. Obviously enough, there's not going to be this sort of violence that you see in Betrayal at House on the Hill or the Betrayal Legacy. So what happens in, in each of these mysteries is when the haunt begins, that character somehow got lost, something will happen. It'll actually tell you in the book what has happened to that particular character who is now going to be the villain. So you can decide ahead of time. So if you are playing as a family, maybe you've got smaller children, they probably don't want to have to stop being Scooby-Doo <laughs> and be the baddie. So one of the parents obviously can sit there and say, okay, well, when that happens, I'll take the role of the bad guy. So we've got the rule book. We've got our secrets of survival, which is for the players who are not the big bad. And then we have the monster's tome for the player who is the big bad. We have 
some tiles for inside and outside locations. We've got a timer track up there, which once the hot, I should say, once the haunt begins, you may end up tracking the turns passing by. We have item cards that can be found. We have clue cards that can be found. We have events that can take place as well. We have standees for each member of Mystery Inc. So we've got Scooby, we got Shaggy, we got Velma, Fred, and Daphne. We've got a lot of different tokens here. And you won't use all these tokens. You will be told which tokens and counters to use depending on the haunt you end up playing. There are 25 mysteries in the game itself, all of them based on an episode of Scooby-Doo or a Scooby-Doo movie. We have these cards here, which are mystery cards. I will talk about those when we zoom in a little closer. And then each of the characters do have their own character board, which we will take a look at those in just a second. Do you want to mention that these character boards do have trackers on them? You're supposed to use these plastic clips. I never do because these plastic clips never fail to tear up the edges of these. So when we play, we just take a piece of scratch paper and keep track of the different attributes of the characters. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about each of the different character boards, the different cards, and so on. And we'll just get a little closer in like so. That's you good. All right. And looks like we're in focus. So first off, let's take a look at the character boards. So each of the characters will have four attributes. We've got speed, might, courage, brains. And you'll notice on the track, you'll have a green number. Well, that is their starting value for that character. The characters can take damage. So even though there's no player elimination in this game, unlike other betrayal games, you do track the attributes because if you end up at zero on any of these, you're knocked unconscious. You're knocked out. So effectively what happens is you miss a turn, but then you get all of your attributes back. So if you were down a few on the different tracks here, if you are knocked out, if you're stunned is basically what it is, then once you are back in action, you'll have everything back up to its starting value. So each of the characters also have a special ability. So Scooby, can move an extra tile on their turn. And the characters will each have two abilities that they can, they can utilize before the haunt begins. One is give and the other is take. Simple enough, it's right here. So what that means is that you can, you can give an item that you've got or a Scooby snack, what have you, to another player if you're on the same tile. And the opposite is true as well. You can take something from a character that's sharing the same tile with you. You can only do each of those once per turn. In fact, when you have other actions that are available to you, depending on what mystery you're playing, you'll have other actions available. But normally you can only do each action once. And then we got a cool little story, a little, little bit of flavored text, a little background text about each of the characters. So we got Scooby. Like I said, his special ability is he can move an extra tile. You can normally move uh, three tiles. So that's why you'll see Scooby's speed is four, Fred's is three. So Fred at the start of the game gets to draw an item card. That's Fred's special ability. Velma can't roll anything less than a three on a brains roll. So that's pretty sweet. So that is Velma's ability. Shaggy can reroll up to two dice when you spend a Scooby snack. Normally, you can only reroll one die when you spend a Scooby snack. You will start the game with a single Scooby snack. Each of the players shall. And then Daphne starts with three Scooby snacks and can actually carry five. Other characters can only carry three. 
Scooby Snacks. And there's various different ways for you to get Scooby Snacks. Now, talking about the dice, we utilize what are normally known as averaging dice. These don't have the usual six sides with one through six pips. We have two blank sides, two sides that have a one, and two sides that have two. Those are your averaging dice. So as an example, if you're rolling three dice, the best you're gonna get out of it is six. The worst you can get is nothing. You can get all blanks. So we've got a handful of these dice as well. So we've got those. We've got these mystery cards. So there are different kinds of mysteries. So for an example, we've got the case of the man-made menace, which is an automation, an automaton mystery. We've got the case of the magical mayhem. So that's magic. The, where we got it? Oh, out of this world. The case from out of this world. So this is, these are aliens. The case of the sinister spirit. So it's ghosts. And the case of the monstrous miscreant. So that, those are the five types of mysteries. The man-made menace style mysteries are the easiest. These are the toughest. But the reality is even the most difficult mystery is still easier than, say, any of the mysteries that take place in Betrayal at House on the Hill, as an example. You're going to choose which one of these you are going to play to start off. So as an example, let's say we're using the case of the Mad Main Menace. So it says, we heard there's an aut automaton in the area. That means a man-made thing like a robot or a giant puppet or even a giant wax monster. We need to look around for clues to see what's going on. Okay, gang, let's split up. And I'll tell you, whenever you draw a clue card, roll a die for each clue a player has. On a five or higher, the haunt begins. Don't roll if you draw the ninth clue, just begin the haunt. There are only nine clue cards anyway. So how do you know? When am I going to take an item card or an event card or clue card? You're going to know based on the tile that you're revealing. So as an example, I'm going to move that out of the way. You're going to start off the game with these two tiles. So we got the mystery machine, which is outside. We've got the entrance to mystery mansion. So everyone's going to start off right here at the Mystery Machine. And remember, you can move up to, unless you're Scooby, you can move four. You can move three tiles. So as an example, let's say Fred is our first player here. So Fred moves. There's one moved there to the entrance. Well, that doesn't have anything for him to be able to do. So we have these doorways here. And the art is actually kind of cool on these rooms. I do, I do like that. There's one room that's got all these ghosts in it. I thought it's kind of funny. So we are inside. So the player controlling Fred can decide, okay, well, I can check to see what's through this door. I can go through this door. I can go through this, this door. So for the sake of argument, let's say Fred's going to go through this door. We're going to flip over a tile, which we've already sat there and shuffled up the two piles of tiles. And here we have a statuary corridor. And we have a little symbol here for an item. So we're going to line this up with one of the doors. I'm going to just move this on over. So we've got that. Fred moves here. Once you discover a tile, when you discover a new room or an area outside, you're going to stop. You're going to end your turn. You can't move any further this way. It gives all the players an opportunity to, to go move around through somewhere to find things so that it's not just one character kind of trailblazing their way through the entire mansion. So here we see we're going to draw an item card. So I'm going to take an item card here, and it's a banana full of potassium. On your turn, you may heal a trait, then move another character on your tile up to two tiles. If you do, bury this card. If you bury a card, that basically means it just goes back as the last card in the deck it goes to. So the banana would go on to the bottom of the item deck. So there you go. So Fred now has this item. Truthfully, Fred should have two items now because 
He starts the game with an item. So that would have been Fred's turn. So let's say it's Shaggy's turn now. So Shaggy decides, okay, hey, so I'm going to go into the entrance here. And now they're going to see what's down this way. So while we're still inside, we're going to flip over a tile. It's a creepy basement. Bum, bum, bum. Heroes who discover this tile immediately lose one courage. So that would mean that Shaggy's courage would go from three down to two. Dun, dun, dun. And remember, if you see a little skull there, that means they're knocked out. So there are, there are times that you could actually have the hunt begin. And I, I keep saying knocked out, they're stunned. But you could begin a haunt and have your character stunned and not be able to do anything for the first turn. So here we would see, let's push this up here. So we see here that there is a clue located in the creepy basement. So we draw a clue card and it says blueprints, even better than a map. After the haunt starts on your turn, you may bury this to move to any discovered tile. So there you go. It says, make a haunt roll now. Well, it would be five or higher. It's only one die. There's no way we're going to get five on the one averaging die. So we don't even have to worry about making any sort of roll. But now Shaggy would have the one clue. And then you're just going to continue to discover areas. You're going to find items. Uh, let's, let's go outside. I'm going to move these over. So we still have the three here. Let's say. Now, Scooby, Velma, and Daphne are going to check out what's going on outside. So it's Scooby's turn. Scooby's going to go down here, flip over outside, and it says it's a cave. So this is also an entrance here for this cave. So I'll push that up so you can see that a little bit better. So we also see that we've got other ways for us to go, too. So we go here. We draw a clue. Scooby gets a clue. It's the treasure chest. You hear a strange thump from inside. When you draw this from the clue deck, immediately draw an item card to see what was inside the treasure chest. Boink, it's dry ice, which allows us to create fog. All right, so Scooby would have these two cards. And then let's say Daphne goes and checks out this way. It's the general store. It says, heroes who discover this tile immediately gain either one courage or one speed before drawing an event card. So the Daphne player would get to decide, okay, are they going to increase their speed or their courage? And then, because it has this symbol on it, we would draw an event card. It says, heap of junk. Hey, it looks like something stuck under there. Make a might roll. Well, Daphne's might is a three. So we're going to roll our three dice. And we get a three. And it says, hey, take a Scooby snack. So Daphne would end up with more Scooby snacks. Could have taken a damage. So when you do take damage, you simply will subtract from any of these. It's your choice. It's your choice what you lose from. In other Betrayal games, they normally will break it up into mental and physical damage. Here, it's just damage. So you take it from any of your tracks. So speed, might, courage, and brains. So you're going to continue on, and you're going to end up building this area. And what you try to do is, like for an example here, if we were coming from this direction, and we just drew this, we try to line up the, the entrances, the doorways, the entries. If you can't, you can't. It's no big deal. So eventually what you're going to have done is you are going to discover a bunch of locations and you're going to be creating the layout of the mansion and the surrounding area. And at some point in time, You'll have gained enough clues that you're going to, somebody's going to roll their dice and they're going to get five or higher, or you're going to run out of clues. And as soon as you run out of the clues, 
that's when the haunt will begin. And that is when you will actually go and see what is the mystery you're playing? Because you don't actually know until the haunt begins. So as an example, let's say the clue that set off the haunt was the idol. So you're going to take your mystery card. You're going to flip it over. You're going to take a look and it. You're going to look for the clue, which was right there. It's the idol. So it says number six. So that means we are now playing in mystery number six. As soon as that happens, the person who, unless it's already been decided that a specific player is going to be the villain, what's going to happen here is the person who triggered the haunt, their character is now out of the game, and now they are playing the villain. So I'll give you an example here. So what we're looking at, six. So now we're going to bust out this book. I'm going to move some of this stuff out of the way so we can see this. So we are playing Backstage Rage. So it says, read this box out loud and follow the setup instructions. How strange. Someone left a broken idol on the floor with cash spilling out of it. It looks like there's a mystery afoot, as well as an angry phantom puppeteer trying to scare everyone with spooky puppets, including an innocent bystander. One of the Mystery Inc. gang is so scared that they ran off and locked themselves in a broom closet. So that's, that's what's happening with the player who is now the bad guy. That's why they're no longer, their character's no longer part of the, the game is because they ran off, they've locked themselves in a broom closet. It's going to be different all the time. Uh, I could really use a ham sandwich to relax right now. Zoinks! So that's going to, choose it's going to walk you through a setup it's going to tell you what tokens you need to break out now because as i mentioned before we've got all these various different tokens and counters and you're not going to use them all so it's going to tell you which one what do we need so we've got the puppeteer we've got evidence we've got the timer track we've got puppets and then we have a woman who's an innocent bystander. So what's the plan? What do we need to do? What do the heroes need to do? Fight the puppets. Blah, fight the puppets. Try to speak English, Jeff. To find evidence before the puppets scare off everyone in the house. Then it's going to tell you how to play this. So you may move and take any or all of the new actions below. So fight the puppeteer or puppets. So this is a new action. Before, all you could do was give and take. Now you've got a new action. Once per turn on the same tile as the puppeteer or the puppets, you may try to stun them. You both make a might roll. If you roll higher, the defender is stunned. If they have an evidence token, you can take it. Otherwise, you take damage equal to the difference in the rolls. Once per turn, while on the general store tile, you may take up the three Scooby Snacks if you do, end your turn. And that's a tip. The puppets are super strong. Scooby Snacks will help you defeat them. Send someone to find the general store and load up on Scooby Snacks. Remember, you can give a Scooby Snack to the hero with the most might. So keep in mind, while you're still, when you're playing the haunt, you can still discover the different tiles. It's still, you're still playing the same as before, but now you also have a villain to worry about. So at the end of the turn, if all the heroes are on the stage tile and the heroes are carrying all the evidence tokens, you win. Dun, dun, dun. So uh, in the setup here, it's saying take, take out the timer track, place a clip on six. So the players would have six turns to do this. So this is the book that the heroes are going to refer to to tell them what's going on in the haunt. But we also have the monster's tome. So the player who is taking on the role of the baddie is going to take this book and also look up six. So it says, what's really going on? I'm Mr. Petria, 
I'm the puppeteer and leader of a secret group that makes fake money. I have hidden cash, printing plates, and plans in my spooky puppets. No one suspected a thing until these meddling kids showed up. Ah, those meddling kids. I gotta, I gotta scare everyone away so they won't bother me anymore. So what's the plan? It says, scare the innocent bystander six times before the heroes can collect all the evidence. Then it tells you some facts. Once again, it's showing the different tokens we need. It says, don't read this until the end of the game. So down at the bottom, if, uh, if the baddie wins, they read one paragraph. If the heroes win, they read that paragraph. And then we get, how do you play this as the villain? So the villain has different rules, different things they're trying to do. We already know that the puppeteer is trying to scare the bystander six times before the heroes get all the evidence and get to the stage. So it's going to tell us all those informations there. It says, at the end of the puppet's turn, if the timer track is at zero, you win. So you have the two booklets. So you have each side is playing a little bit asymmetrical as far as what they need to do to win the game. And that is pretty much how you're going to play Scooby-Doo. I'm going to bring this back out again. Let's zoom back out. There we go. So that's pretty much what goes on in each of the mysteries for Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. You're going to pretty much do the same exact thing to start off each game. You're just going and discovering these tiles and you're gaining items, gaining clues, as well as having events take place as you're going throughout. Then at one point, the haunt will start. One of the players is gonna be, one of the characters is gonna drop out of the game be replaced with the baddie, and then the baddie is going to try to pretty much obtain or finish off their own victory objectives, while the heroes are going to have their own objectives, or sometimes they just need to stop the villain from succeeding at what they're trying to do. And that's it. That is essentially it to the game. If the heroes win, you're going to read one paragraph that's going to be, you know, all oh, those meddling kids. Or if the heroes fail, then the villain gets to read their uh, victory paragraph as well. And all in all, in a nutshell, that is pretty much how you play Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion. So let's swing on over to the other camera and I will share my final thoughts as well as provide a review score. So let me grab a quick sip here. It is awfully dry down here in the duct tape studios tonight. It's funny, I just did another uh, video yesterday. I shot a video yesterday and it was super humid. It's weird. All right, so what are my thoughts about Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion? It's fun. Personally, I have never been a huge fan of the Betrayal games. Simply because I'm not super keen on one of the players having to suddenly become the bad guy. Uh, at least in this, they don't become like a homicidal maniac or anything like that. Something silly happens to them. They get stuck in a revolving door or... They, they are off looking for the sneakers that they dropped. They lost the shoe and they're busy off trying to find the shoe. That's why they're not in it. They don't get, you know, murdered or anything like that. Wouldn't be very family friendly if that was the case. The game plays out pretty much the same up until the haunt. It's just each player is pretty much moving around trying to find a tile that hasn't been discovered yet so that they get an opportunity to flip over a tile, take a clue, get an item, have an event, what have you. The game kicks into action when the haunt starts. And some of the haunts are kind of cool. They're kind of fun. They're not easy. 
for Mystery Inc. to win either. So the villain does have an opportunity to pull off a win. Some are easier than others, as I mentioned before. And they are sort of set as a progression in increasing difficulty. But for an example, if, uh, if you're looking at the uh, automaton, it's not sequentially, the mysteries aren't in sequential order, right? So we were looking at number six. Well, number five and number seven are not automaton mysteries. That's why we've got the little mystery card that will tell us the number of the mystery. I kind of think it's it's fun that you don't you don't know what mystery you're playing until the haunt starts. I thought that was kind of fun. I think younger gamers and their parents will have a good time with betrayal at Mystery Mansion with Scooby and the gang. I, I really do. I, I think the component quality is nice. Uh, it's not, you know, incredible, but I have to be honest, it's better than the original quality for the Avalon Hill betrayal at House on the Hill that came out a few years back, the, I guess, the, the newest edition of it. So got to point out, I like the component quality better than that. I think the game plays a little smoother than that as well. I like the fact that, uh, you know, you, there's, you're not rolling dice to find things like, say, Betrayal Legacy. You could have a character go into a room and maybe there's an item there and they're rolling dice to see if they find it and they don't find it. It's possible for, you know, players in that game to be wandering around not getting anything just because of bad dice rolls. That doesn't happen here. If a, if a character, Standy, finds a tile, you move into a tile, something's going to happen. You're going to have your little moment in the spotlight. So I like that as well. It's just, I don't want to say the rules have been kind of dumbed down from the other Betrayal games, but I think they've just been kind of just evened out, kind of smoothed out. We didn't have those uh, weird kind of hiccups that uh, I had had years ago when I played Betrayal at House on the Hill, where it's kind of like, uh, what are we supposed to be doing? What? So the rules are pretty well laid out as well. I do like the fact that when the haunt starts, you might have various new rules that are introduced to the game that you haven't played with before. I like that. I thought that was kind of cool as well. Uh, as far as cons go, like I said before, I can't stand the little clips that are supposed to go on these because I know it's going to tear these up. So I don't use the clips to track the characteristics on here, the attributes on here. I wish they'd come up with a, something different than, than the clips. Also, does it feel like it's Scooby-Doo? Mm, yeah, well, a little. I don't think the theme is really cooked into it. It feels like a betrayal game for kids as opposed to it's Scooby-Doo. I know, yes, the missions do. You know, they, they are based on episodes of the series as well as Scooby-Doo movies. I get that. It's, I don't know. Thematically, I'd say it's a little weak. It's not terrible, just a little weak. And there isn't a ton of challenge to it. Uh, once you've played it a few different times, you, there is kind of a repetition, even though you do have the different mysteries, you will have some different rules involved. It is still a little bit of rinse and repeat. But all in all, it is fun. And I can see that younger gamers, big fans of Scooby-Doo, as well as uh, family gamers, parents, will get a kick out of playing Betrayal at Mystery Mansion with their family uh, because it is, it's for ages eight and up, but it is not simply just a kiddie game. So all in all, on a score of one to 10, I give Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion a seven out of 10. All right, so that is it for this time out. Do wanna remind you, if you like this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. 
subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't, and if you do subscribe, ring that notification bell. It'll tell you not only when I upload videos such as this, it'll also tell you when the Daily Dope streams live right here on YouTube, Monday through Thursday nights with the latest in tabletop gaming news. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in gaming news or reviews and a whole lot more. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. All right, that is it for this time. I will see you next time, or if you pop in to catch the Daily Dope. But as I like to sign off, unfortunately, during this time of pandemic, let me remind you to please be smart and stay safe. Oh, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. And of course, if you want to catch up on past episodes of The Daily Dope, check out this playlist. And if you'd like to see what YouTube's recommending you take a peek at from the channel, just give a click right over here. Of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. And once again, thank you very much for watching.